It's a tremendous honor for me to be invited to this distinguished gathering at this most prestigious university. Thank you, members of the Oxford Union, for your kind and gracious welcome. I'm really delighted to be here. I want to talk this evening about why and how I became a lawyer. I want to talk about how, as the son of a scrap metal dealer from New Haven, Connecticut, I founded and built what I am proud to say is one of the leading law firms in the United States, and how our firm came to play the predominant role in so many of our country's most significant legal matters over the past 25 years, including most recently representing the President of the United States. I was born and raised in a middle-class household in New Haven, uh, not far from Yale University where I ended up attending college. Yale was founded in 1701 while we colonials were still English subjects, and Yale is one of the oldest universities in the country. I always thought that that was really impressive. Yale was really old. That is, of course, until I came here to Oxford. Um, now, as I understand it, Oxford was founded in around 1096. 1096. Six centuries before Yale. I think 1096, someone told me as I was coming over that that was like um, the first crusade or something like that. That's old. That's old. I'm impressed. Now let's jump ahead about a thousand years. I live and work in New York City. If any of you come to visit me, and I hope that you will, uh, I think you'll see that our law firm's offices are comfortable and maybe even elegant. Uh, I've got a large corner office. Uh, I've got a large conference room which is connected to my corner office with a sign outside that says Mark's Conference Room. I've got, some, I've got a gleaming big desk, a lot of stylish furniture, and a really, really impressive view of the Hudson River out my windows. But to me, the most meaningful thing in my office, apart, of course, from the pictures that I have, the many pictures I have of my daughter and my wife, uh, is a old photograph which is located right by my desk. It's a black and white photograph and it's a picture of my father, Bob Kazowitz. Bob passed away three years ago. He was the primary inspiration for my becoming an, a lawyer, although he never went to college, let alone law school. And he continues to be the primary inspiration in my life for how I aspire to conduct my career. Now, if there's one thing that defined my father, it was his seemingly limitless capacity for hard work and his unyielding determination to succeed. My dad did not grow up with money. He grew up in a tough section of New Haven, grew up in a house with two bedrooms, six brothers, two sisters, all who lived in those two bedrooms, and the house had a small junkyard behind it. The family scraped out their living from that junkyard. I want to show you a picture of my father from about 70 years ago. We like to call this, uh, for any of you who are movie aficionados, we like to call this my dad's Marlon Brando on the waterfront picture. I think it tells you everything you need to know about how hard my father worked. He's dressed in a smudged, stained t-shirt. He's in his late 20s. He's working in the junkyard behind his house. And if you look at his face, he's got this look of absolute, intense concentration on it. It looks as if he's been working for hours already and for hours to come. And I have to say, he was a handsome guy. My father really was. He was a handsome guy. I've got a twin brother. My brother looks like my father. That's where he got his looks. A few years after this picture was taken, uh, my dad started his own scrap metal business. He started it uh, in New Haven. And unlike my day, which is spent entirely at a desk, uh, my father's day was not spent at a desk. For years, he spent most of his day at a table in an unheated room in a really large warehouse where he was separating and throwing 
pieces of metal into different barrels around the room. It was really difficult, really tiring work, but it had to be done, and he was good at it, so that's what he did. I always marveled at my father's powers of concentration. No matter what the task was, whether it was cleaning metal or negotiating a deal, my dad would focus totally on what he was doing, almost oblivious to everything else. And a scrap metal yard was not a quiet place. It was not a contemplative place at all. There were trucks driving in and out. There were magnets from these large cranes that were constantly pounding down on piles of metal to put them into the trucks that were driving in and out. There were workers that were moving all over the yard. They were loading trucks, they were unloading trucks, they were driving lift trucks and the like. They were unloading scrap from, from customers' trucks. Through all of that, my strongest recollection of my dad was that he was constantly and continually focused. I can recall watching him in a day like that, studying the piles of scrap metal in the yard. And I realized years later that what he was doing was taking inventory. He was figuring out what he was going to sell, when he was going to sell it, and who he was going to sell it to. My father also seemed to have a very keen sense of value. He had this ability to create value out of the unlikeliest material. Years later, I brought a, a Yale friend of mine, a college friend of mine, uh, to the scrap metal yard, and he commented that the yard looked like nothing more than piles of junk. Well, the Bob Kazowitz, those piles of junk, paid for a home and food and clothes for his family and school for his kids. Those piles of junk were gold to Bob Kazowitz. Now, my dad was the toughest, most disciplined person I ever knew. And when I say tough, I don't mean that he was just tough on himself. He could also be tough on the people around him, the people that he loved. And when we were young, my brother and I used to work at the uh, scrapyard. And when I, I must confess, and I'm using the term work loosely, at least as it applied to me. My father used to love to tell this story about how one Saturday he pointed my brother and me to a big pile of hardcover books. And he gave us each a, a, small wooden, a small knife with a wooden handle. And our job was to cut the bindings off the, uh, off the books. And then the paper part of the books would be uh, gathered together, bailed up and sold uh, for scrap paper. And an hour or two later, when my dad came by to see how we were doing, he found Stephen whipping through his pile, cutting the books off like crazy, throwing the paper into another pile, and he found me on top of the pile reading the books that my brother hadn't gotten to yet. But dad wasn't one to let that lesson of hard work be lost on uh, Stephen and me, especially me. So several years later, when I was working at the yard during a Christmas vacation, he sent me and one of his older brothers, who worked there also, to a barn in Cheshire, Connecticut. And the job that we had at this barn in Cheshire was to take all the metal that was in it to bring it back to the, uh, to the scrap yard. Now, the fact that it was minus 12 degrees Celsius, the fact that the barn was not heated, the fact that all I was wearing was a light work jacket, some unlined work gloves, and some light pants, no hat, uh, all of this was of absolutely no moment to my dad. He told my uncle to bring me with him. The job shouldn't take that long. And that's what we did. <laughs> when we returned to the scrapyard at the end of the day, Dad also wasn't too impressed by the fact that my face was blue. I had no feelings in my hands, no feelings in my feet whatsoever, nor was he troubled when we got home to, to our house that night. He wasn't troubled at all uh, when my mom went to feel my feet and hands and couldn't feel anything at all except for cold, and, and, and said to him, Bob, how could you bring Mark out to this place in the freezing cold all day long? Ah, it was a little chilly out there, Dad said. Mark will be fine. A little hard work never hurt anyone. Needless to say, that experience 
and a few others like it cured me of my burning desire to ever go into the scrap metal business. <laughs> Thanks very much. But even though I sometimes froze my bottom off, even though I worked in the blazing heat and humidity, even though I frequently came home so tired I couldn't move, I remember those days fondly. Those days were over 50 years ago, and I remember them like they were yesterday. And my most vivid recollections of those days has nothing to do with scrap metal. It has nothing to do with the piles of, 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 of metal. It has nothing to do with the smell of the metal, the smell of the dust, and the smell of the dirt that was everywhere. My vivid re recollections are ones of my dad and how he interacted with everyone, the men who worked for him and his customers. My father was not a big talker, and he rarely, if ever, raised his voice. But I remember being struck by how all the people around him treated him with enormous, unqualified respect. And it seemed to me that my father commanded that respect by his presence alone. A gesture here, a gesture there, a nod of his head. People seemed to know exactly what he wanted to have done, when he wanted to have it done, and how he wanted to have it done. And they followed, his, they followed those, those gestures to a T without question. And when he was dealing with customers, when he was setting the price for copper or bronze or some kind of metal, there wasn't any haggling about it. There wasn't any negotiating about it with Bob Kazowitz. Bob set the price. That was it. And over the years, I came to realize that my father earned the respect of everyone around him, not just at work, but everywhere, because of the special kind of man he was. He was smart, hardworking, honest, and fair. He was totally self-made and self-reliant. He was tough and he was disciplined. And although he was well accomplished and although he succeeded at almost everything he did, he never bragged about himself. Dad was modest and he was humble. And these are qualities that I confess I have the most difficulty emulating. Most importantly, Dad had a moral compass. He had a sense of right and wrong. That sense of right and wrong never wavered was never compromised. His moral compass was not the kind that swung in the direction that the wind was blowing. He did not adjust his principles to adopt popular positions or to avoid unpopular ones. To Bob Kazowitz, the truth wasn't something that you bent or adjusted or manipulated to your advantage, and you didn't do that with your principles either. And not only was Bob Kazowitz loyal to his principles, he was, not surprisingly, steadfastly loyal to his family, his friends, and his customers. So when a family member had a problem, or when a friend was in trouble, or when a customer was in dire straits, dad was always there. He was there with advice. He was there with financial support. He was there with friendship, even in the worst of times. Bob Kazowitz did not cut and run. He wasn't built that way. And because of those qualities, my father had the unique ability to think and analyze clearly and realistically, and to give support and advice in such a calm, reassuring, intelligent, and often creative way that he always made things better for his family and his friends. Just knowing he was there, knowing that he was behind you, knowing that he had your back, that was the greatest thing in the world. Emulating those qualities is one of the things that I find most gratifying in my practice, being called upon to advise and help and reassure clients who are in challenging times. Now, I hope you'll forgive me for speaking at such great length about my father. He was a very special man, and all of that helps to explain why I do what I do. I always thought that the kinds of qualities that I admired so much in my father were the, the qualities that made him who he was are the qualities, precisely the kinds of qualities, 
that could make someone a really effective and successful lawyer. And those are the kinds of qualities that I've tried to emulate in my professional career. So let's fast forward. I went to law school. I made partner at a major New York law firm. And I founded our firm in 1993. We started with 18 lawyers and one client. We now today have 300 lawyers in offices across the country, and we have a roster of diverse and prominent clients. We have a robust pro bono practice, which services the needs of local legal aid societies, victims of sexual abuse, and victims of political oppression and terrorism abroad who seek asylum in the United States. Now, our goal from the time we formed our firm back in 1993 was to represent clients intelligently, creatively, and aggressively in handling their most challenging cases. And to do that work in an environment where people treated each other with respect and consideration. I'm going to talk to you about some of the cases we've done, about some of the representations that we've undertaken. And these representations have made our firm stand out, I think, amongst our peers. And they've attracted clients with serious, often bet the company problems. One unifying theme I think you will take away from this is that the strategic decisions that we've made on behalf of our clients have not always been conventional. They haven't always been popular. But we never shied away from making those decisions because we believed that those decisions were in our clients' best interests. And no matter how loud the noise around us, like my father in his warehouse, we always stayed focused on the task at hand, which helped us to get good results, not great results, for our clients. From the time we started our firm, we faced enormous challenges in our cases. For example, in 1993, our one client was a major chemical company. It was being sued in literally tens of thousands of lawsuits around the country, and these lawsuits arose from allegedly defective plumbi uh, um, plastic plumbing systems. Plastic plumbing systems that had been installed in homeowners' homes that leaked. The plaintiffs in those cases were the homeowners, the people who had the homes. They had these leaking plumbing systems. They sued the companies which had designed and manufactured the systems, and they also sued our client, this chemical company, which had made a raw material that was used in making the joints for those systems. When we came into those cases, the lawyers for the homeowners, in a tactical play, had joined forces with the lawyers for the other defendants, the people who had designed and installed those systems, and they all sought to blame our client, the chemical company that had made the raw material, the plastic, in the joints. They all sought to blame our client for the leaks in those systems. Literally everyone in the case was shooting at our client. And in two trials before we became involved, our client got hit with massive, massive verdicts. If those verdicts had been permitted to continue, then our client was going to be put out of business. In any event, to turn the tide in those cases and to save the company from going bankrupt, we came up with a new strategy, an aggressive strategy. Our strategy was to go ahead and sue all those other co-defendants to try to hold them responsible for the leaks in those systems. And that's exactly what we did. We ended up using the lawsuits against those other companies to get them to pay millions and millions of dollars to fix the plumbing systems that had been leaking. We entered into a nationwide class action settlement. The settlement was really good for our clients, and it was good for the homeowners because we were able to compel these other companies uh, to pay the full freight. Now, the most important lesson that, that I draw uh, from those cases is that our clients' needs took precedence, even if we had to alienate the other major companies and their lawyers. And 
Let me tell you, we really did alienate them. When we attacked them, including a trial to demonstrate that they were responsible for the leaks in those systems, uh, they weren't happy. The lawyers complained that we weren't playing by the rules. They complained that we were being too aggressive. But we knew that the only way that we were going to be able to appropriately protect our client was to demonstrate who really had the liability for why those systems were leaking. So that's exactly what we did. And again, the Bob Kazowitz model. Hard work, perseverance, laser-like focus on the task at hand. Ultimately, after trying several of these cases in court and going to verdicts where the juries found these other co-defendants responsible, we were able to get the homeowners their systems paid for, and we were able to avoid significant liability to our client. Now, while we started our firm working on these product liability cases involving those plumbing systems, the cases which really put our firm on the map and the cases which had enormous legal and historic significance were the tobacco settlements of the mid-1990s. Those settlements, which we negotiated, saved our client, which had become a whistleblower in the tobacco industry, and led to marketing reforms and to price increases, which have resulted in a significant decline in smoking in the United States over the past 25 years. To understand the significance of these settlements and the impact they had, it's important to remember at least for those of us who were around at that time, which is very few people in this room, you know, when I'm looking around here, I realize how old I really am getting. Um, but, but times have changed dramatically since then as concerns smoking. As of the mid-1990s, the tobacco companies were still insisting that there was no medical or scientific connection between smoking and diseases like lung cancer or emphysema. What I just said is a thousand percent true. The tobacco companies in 1995 claimed that smoking did not cause lung cancer. Second, as of that time, for nearly 60 years before, the tobacco companies had been uniformly successful in defending cases brought by smokers against the tobacco companies for smoking-related disease. The companies succeeded in defeating any cases, and they also succeeded in preventing the plaintiffs from putting any of their claims together. Plaintiffs were unable to certify a class of smokers to bring an action against the tobacco company, and they were unable to aggregate any claims at all, anything more than one individual claim against a tobacco company. So by the mid-1990s, all you had were individual smokers suing tobacco companies, and that did not pose very much of a threat to the tobacco companies. The tobacco companies played real hardball in those cases. They used their superior strength and their superior resources to really grind down the individual smokers and their lawyers. And in 60 years of litigation, the tobacco companies never paid a settlement, never lost a case. By the mid-1990s, however, there was a new wave of litigation coming. In or about 1995, five states filed actions against the tobacco industry, and they sought to recover all the money that the states had spent in treating smoking-related disease in state-owned and operated hospitals. So all of a sudden, you had these cases against the tobacco industry seeking literally billions and billions of dollars. At the time, Liggett was represented by some law firms that had been part of kind of the old guard. They denied everything. They defended everything. We were representing Liggett's owners in some unrelated cases, and my partner Dan Benson and I came up with the idea that Liggett should try to settle those new lawsuits brought by these five states and any subsequent lawsuits that, uh, uh, that were brought. 
and our thinking was, which really was a dramatic departure from, from the industry, our thinking was threefold. First, unlike the lawyers for the rest of the industry, we thought that these cases uh, would have real merit, that they would not be easily dismissed. Second, we also thought that there was potentially a financial play for Liggett in these cases. We thought that if Liggett settled the cases and was the first in, they could settle them very inexpensively on good terms. If the cases became a threat against the rest of the industry, then the way that the industry would raise the money to pay the, case, uh, the states to settle would be, raised to be to raise the price of cigarettes. If the rest of the industry raised the price of cigarettes and paid the money over to the states, we thought that Liggett might be able to raise the price of cigarettes too, but keep the money for itself. So there would be a financial benefit to Liggett as well. And third, we believed that it was long past time for the tobacco companies to admit the reality with respect to smoking, to come to terms with the fact that smoking caused horrendous diseases and was addictive. In, flat, in fact, our plan worked out better than we ever could have suspected or expected because within three years, from 1996 to 1998, we were able to settle with all 50 states. Uh, Liggett was able to settle with all 50 states for very little money, relatively low amount. The rest of the industry, these cases did become a threat against the rest of the industry, and the rest of the industry uh, settled with all 50 states for $250 billion payable over 25 years. So this ended up being a great financial benefit for our client because instead of taking the price increases and paying it over to the states, it kept those price increases, those very large ones. Liggett went from a two and a half dollar stock by late 1995 to a $48 stock by the time of the last settlement in Thanksgiving of 1998. But in addition, in addition to these financial terms, there were very, very important other terms to these agreements. The tobacco industry agreed by 1998 to stop marketing its products to minors and to children. The tobacco industry agreed by 1998 to put additional warnings on their cigarette packages, including warning that smoking was addictive. And the tobacco industry agreed to raise the price of cigarettes, as I said before. And the largest single factor in contributing to the diminution in smoking in the United States over the past 25 years has been the fact that cigarettes are a heck of a lot more expensive today than they were back then. In 1995, a pack of cigarettes in New York City and Manhattan might cost about a dollar and a half. Today, it costs closer to $15. Now, the settlements benefited Liggett um, uh, and they benefited the country uh, at the beginning, uh, our co-defendants, the other tobacco companies, weren't too happy. Um, remember, these settlements disrupted a deeply entrenched 60-year strategy and public relations policy. So you can be sure that Mr. LeBeau, who was the CEO of Liggett, and I were not terribly welcome at the other tobacco companies' year-end parties, Christmas parties, that year. Fact is, we weren't even invited. But as I said earlier, with respect to these plumbing cases, the noise from these other companies was not our issue. That was not my concern. Those companies had their own lawyers. Our responsibility, our obligation, our job was to take care of our client. And that's what we did. Mr. LeBeau uh, said at one point that those, to, those, th those settlements were not just good for Liggett, they were even better for the country. So what we did was disruptive. We broke from the group. We broke from a, a, a kind of herd mentality. We found a solution to a problem that took care of our clients' interests and had the added additional effect of helping society. Our being willing to acknowledge the reality of what was happening in the tobacco industry and having the backbone to take a stand when others refused to do so, 
That was exactly what my dad, Bob Kazowitz, would do. So let's fast forward to today. For the past 20 years, we've continued to be involved in lots of high-profile, important cases. We defended the Port Authority of the City of New York, which was sued in the 1993 World Trade Center bombing case, and we won that case on appeal. We defeated some of the world's largest banks in a $5 billion trial arising out of the financial crisis. And we won a fraud case against Goldman Sachs in New York's highest uh, court, the Court of Appeals, uh, relating to a pool of securities that had been backed by subprime mortgages. That case is called ACA versus Goldman Sachs, and it's now the leading decision in New York on the standard for commercial fraud cases. And in each of these cases, and notice, I've deliberately and very carefully only told you about cases that I've won. There's no need for us to discuss the other ones right now. <laughs> Seriously, in each of these cases, we had to demonstrate the kinds of characteristics and qualities that my dad exemplified. Perseverance, commitment, focus, toughness, creativity. Now, as I mentioned earlier, as Chris mentioned, I represent the President of the United States. I'm proud to have represented President Trump and his companies and his family uh, for the past 15 years, 16 years, and I'm proud to have continued that representation both during and after the presidential campaign. During the campaign, I represented the President in connection with certain interactions uh, that were had with the New York Times. In one case, uh, I obtained a court order rejecting the New York Times attempt to unseal President Trump's divorce file from 1991. In two other instances, I sent letters to the Times advising it that articles that it had been planning to publish were defamatory. I think it's an understatement to say that the media and the public uh, seemed highly interested in what I had to say in those letters and in what the Times had to say back to me. In fact, after David McGraw, who was a lawyer with the New York Times, responded to my second letter late in the campaign, uh, he became a bit of a celebrity. Uh, he was immediately promoted to Deputy General Counsel of the New York Times. He was invited to be a commencement speaker at uh, several graduations in the metropolitan area. Uh, and I understand that he was also uh, asked to write a book by a couple of uh, publishing ho houses. Recently, I had breakfast with David. He's a really good guy. And I told him that any of the honorariums uh, that he earned as a result of any of the speeches that he was giving, and certainly any books that he wrote, had to be half mine. I also told him that if he didn't pay up, I would sue him. <laughs> We've also represented the President uh, in uh, the special counsel investigation uh, and other matters. And while I anticipate that I will get a number of questions during the Q&A about my work for the President, I hope that you'll all understand uh, that, as with any client, I have an attorney-client privilege with the President, uh, so my matters are, so my answers to these questions are likely to be um, quite limited. As a threshold matter, um, I think it's also safe to say that representing the President of the United States is, as we say in the United States, uh, a long way from sorting metal in a New Haven scrapyard. But it also presents certain unique challenges. And one of those challenges, one of the greatest ones of those challenges, I think, is dealing with the intensity of the media's interest, not just in the President himself, uh, but in everything and everyone uh, connected with him. I was a bit surprised by this at the beginning, I, I have to say. Um, when my wife, Lori, who I'm happy to say is with us tonight, um, so go easy on me in the Q&A. You've been warned, okay? When Lori uh, commented to me at the beginning of all of this that taking on this representation would involve a lot of media scrutiny, I really poo-pooed it. I really did. 
I said, I'm just the lawyer. They will not be interested in me. Ha! <laughs> to say that I got that wrong is yet another understatement, to say the least. I should have realized that how wrong I had gotten it when a day or two after that, um, there was a national, there was a story in a national uh, uh, news media that reported that I was smoking a cigar uh, outside uh, our building in Manhattan uh, with one of my partners. And the story reported that smoking that cigar must have been uh, the celebration of some victory relating to the president in the special counsel investigation, and the reporter was eager to know what that victory was. Um, I didn't issue any comment about it at the time, but I really wish I had uh, remembered to invoke what Sigmund Freud said about uh, cigars. Sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, members of the Oxford Union, we live in a world that is unfortunately overheated and overwrought. With the internet and with social media, news travels at breakneck speed and the need to respond is even faster. There's intense pressure all around and too often that pressure leads to distraction, hyperbole and lies. Careers can be affected, Reputations can be tarnished. Reputations can be destroyed. I think my father's advice, what he would have said to me in this situation, is perfect. Stay calm and relaxed. Keep focused. Block out the background noise. Figure out what is real. Treat people fairly. Concentrate on what your client needs and focus on your own values in getting there. At the end of the day, everything will be fine. It always is. Thank you. So firstly, Mark, thank you so much for taking the time to join us this evening. I know uh, I asked Mark uh, just as we were walking around Oxford before this event, um, how he managed to find time uh, and whether he'd, he'd incorporated this trip with other business. And he said, no, the reason he came over was for this event and, uh, and other things have come up. So it, it really is a privilege. Thank you for, for joining us. Thank you. Um, you gave a very comprehensive <coughs> overview of, of how you got into, the, uh, into law and, and to acquire the position you have uh, and to, to have worked on the cases you have. So I'm going to move away from the sort of generality and, and, and dive into some specifics uh, that you've worked on, which I, I, you, you uh, alluded that you envisaged. Um, firstly, you have handled, as you said, many cases uh, which are very high profile and, uh, and had a lot of media interest. Uh, more, most recently, you handled the Bill O'Reilly uh, case. Um, how uh, do, does the increased uh, media attention make a difference to how you handle a case? Or do you just ignore that and, and it's all about the law? Because you said that a, a focus of yours is strategy and media must come into that a little bit. That's a good question, Chris. Um, look, I think that the, as a general matter, the intense interest that the media has in situations like Bill O'Reilly's uh, doesn't change how we handle the case, but it does change how we interface publicly. So that years and years ago, um, if you were making a motion in a particular case, um, you made the motion. You didn't also make a motion, prepare a press statement, or prepare a response to what the other side's press statement was going to be. Now, just to, and I'm speaking generally, now as a general matter, almost everything that you do in any particular case um, uh, where there's uh, you know, any kind of profile by your client or a client on the other side means that you have to be prepared to deal with uh, the, the media aspects of it. Um, and, and but it doesn't change, from, from, from my point of view, it really doesn't change the underlying strategy. It doesn't change what motion you're going to make. It's going to change how you're going to socialize the media as to the importance of that motion uh, and the like. 
Okay, uh, and I, I guess the dive can continue on that media track, but dive into perhaps something more controversial for you. Um, some media outlets made out uh, a story uh, about the fact that you represented President Trump uh, during the Russia probe, uh, and at the same time you had Russia, Russian clients uh, working at the Kremlin, and they drew a link there. Do you think that was fair of them to, to, to speculate like that, or, or is that just part of a job? What, what is your comment on that? Well, I thought that the articles at the time, and they were articles on CNN and MSNBC, uh, were um, not appropriate. The reason that they weren't appropriate is because they were building or trying to build on no facts whatsoever uh, and on sort of senseless and irresponsible speculation uh, to try to create some suspicion. The reality is that the, uh, our law firm had clients that were Russian-based, just like every, virtually every single major law firm in the country does. Uh, and these uh, relationships had been uh, for years prior to you know, uh, uh, this past election and the like. So uh, when uh, MSNBC and CNN did pieces that tried to create innuendo and speculation, say, well, isn't it curious uh, that Mark Kazowitz has a law firm that has represented um, certain Russian companies, and uh, he's also uh, a lawyer uh, um, for President Trump? Um, you know, in, in, might there be some odd connections and the like? I don't think that's what reporting in media is about. Reporting in media should be based on facts. Um, I think that the job of the media is to re report facts. I'm a lawyer. I live in facts. I live in, I live in facts that I can prove during a trial uh, or in defenses I need to assert to defend a client at a trial. I think that the kind of speculation and innuendo that the media often engage in is irresponsible, and I thought it was there as well. And. Your response to those, those articles, how, how, how did you feel you should respond? How did you, uh, what, what strategy did you, did you approach? And do you regret how you handled it, uh, the media and, and that speculation? No, I think we, uh, we virtually did not respond at all. I think we had one response to one article uh, that was very, very, uh, very, very limited. Uh, so I think we did it the right way. Okay. Um, one of the things President Trump uh, said during his campaign was that um, Hillary Clinton should go to jail uh, because of the uh, email accounts. From a, a legal uh, perspective and as Trump's personal attorney, do you think had uh, President Trump pursued criminal charges against Hillary Clinton, she would have gone to jail? Um. <laughs> I'm not going to speculate on... Um, I'm not going to speculate on what the outcome would have been if there had been a prosecution and indictment uh, based on um, the destruction of those emails. Uh, I'm, I'm just not going to do that. Uh, I don't think that that would be a responsible thing for me to do right now. Okay. Um. <laughs> This, but thanks for the question. <laughs> well, it's sort of linked to it, but perhaps you could comment on this. This September, it was revealed that Trump officials have occasionally used private email accounts to discuss White House business, uh, and Hillary Clinton called that the height of hypocrisy. Uh, do you think uh, she has reason to call it hypocrisy? What do you, from again, from a, a legal perspective, how, how would you respond to that? Um, I'm trying really, really hard to be <laughs> restrained. Uh, look, I, I, again, I don't think it's an area that I should really com comment on other than to make one observation. Um, if the media reports for months and months can be believed, uh, and based on what I read, uh, um, Secretary Clinton's uh, email situation involved the destruction of well over 30,000 emails after those materials had been subpoenaed by Congress. Um, 
Now, again, these are just media reports, but I think um, the other emails that you're talking about that hadn't been on government servers were in the few dozen. So you can infer from that <laughs> whatever you like, but no, look, I, th I think that's not a fair comparison by, 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 Secretary, uh, by Secretary Clinton. She had literally thousands and she had over 30,000 emails that were called for by Congress and then they disappeared. Um, that's a serious issue. Okay. All right, we can, we can move on slightly now from, sure. from that. Um, obviously, you have been representing President Trump for 15 years and you continue to do so. Why, why do you think you are, are that person? You're the one he turns to for that, that personal legal advice. Uh, what makes you stand out from those other lawyers? I think you'd have to ask President Trump why he's asked me to uh, be helpful to him. Um, he's had some quotes in, 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 in media, you know, over the years, and I think you'd, you'd want to turn to that media. Okay. Um, and Because and I am, by my nature, very humble, so I'm certainly not going to, <laughs> you know, speculate about that. Okay. What, uh, what has been the most challenging case um, that you've worked on uh, throughout your career? You know, it's hard to think of the cases that aren't challenging uh, in our career. People don't bring us, and I don't mean to, you know, avoid giving you a specific example, but the reality is that people don't bring us easy cases. They just don't. Um, and I think that that's one of the things that, you know, it's one of the things we're grateful for, and it's one of the things that distinguishes us from most of our peers. Um, clients come to us with really, really difficult situations, uh, and they hope that we can either uh, that we can extricate them or we can recover for them, uh, you know, the very large amounts of money that they're looking for. I mean, take the 1993 World Trade Center bombing case, for example. I think it's a, you know, it's kind of a useful example. Um, that case had been uh, defended in-house by the Port Authority, which owned and operated the, uh, uh, the World Trade Center um, uh, for 12 years. Um, prior to the case going to trial, um, uh, a decision was made to go seek outside counsel. They interviewed 20 firms, they selected us to do it. The reason that the case was very, very difficult to defend was because what happened in that case, as I said, was that um, a, some terrorists drove a van into the unsecured parking lot of the World Trade Center, left the van with a bomb, walked out, the bomb blew up, uh, there was enormous damage to the World Trade Center, uh, there were 3,000 injuries and six fatalities. Um, the people who were injured and, um, <clears throat> and killed uh, and some of the businesses that were disrupted in the building uh, brought a lawsuit. Uh, a really, really big one. And their claim was that the building hadn't been properly secured. The reason it was a hard case to defend was because in the mid-1980s, the Port Authority had had a study done. And the study said that the World Trade Center uh, could have a situation where terrorists would take a van, drive it into the basement, which was not secured, leave a very large bomb there and blow up the World Trade Center and there wasn't enough uh, security there to be able to defend it. Um, so that document made this a very hard case to defend. We ultimately won it though. I think uh, now would be a good time to open up to the audience if you don't mind. Sure. Um, so if you have a question, please raise your hand nice and high and wait for the microphone to come to you. Um, yeah, let's start with you on the end. Yeah, you. Thanks for coming to speak to us. Uh, obviously, the US and Canada and the UK legal system is adversarial, so someone needs to represent anyone. <clears throat> Excuse me. What would it take for you to drop a client? What would it take for me to drop a client? In terms of drawing a kind of ethical line in the sand of their behavior, obviously someone needs to represent a client, but we've seen recently some of Harvey Weinstein's uh, lawyers have dropped him as a client. So what would it take for you and where do you draw that line in the sand? 
Um, well, look, uh, we take on, I, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a hard hypothetical to answer. Um, I don't think that I have ever dropped the client for reasons relating to the, the problem that the client has had. Uh, I think that's what you're suggesting. Uh, in other words, I think what you're saying to me is, is there a client you wouldn't represent because of what that client has done? Is that, is that the question? Yeah, correct. Okay. Um, yeah, there are, there are clients that I would not represent uh, because of what they've done. Um, I haven't had that situation in my, in my career um, so far. Um, uh, theoretically, hypothetically, if I were representing a client and a client were not being honest with me, uh, weren't telling me the truth about her or his situation or their company's situation, that would be a reason that I would drop a client because if, the, if a bond of trust is broken between a lawyer and a client or a client and a lawyer, uh, then, I think that the, then I think the relationship is fundamentally disrupted and at least for me, uh, it would not be worth pursuing. Um, so, so that would be a situation. Yeah. Great, thank you for that question. Um, yeah, let's go to you. Just wait for the microphone. Yeah, stand up. Um, thank you very much for coming. Um, I would like to go back to the way you described your father um, as an honest man and a man that you took a lot from and a man who treated the people who worked with him with a lot of respect. And I was wondering if you had any trouble reconciling that with the person who employs you currently, Donald Trump, who has been accused many times and has settled cases in which he has mistreated some of his workers, uh, not paid them, and just a man who um, is very brusque and could be described as the antithesis of your father. Um, look, my experience with the president uh, is that he treats the people who work for him uh, extremely well. Um, I've worked not only, obviously, over the course of the last, you know, 15 years, 20 years, I've worked not only with him, but I've worked with people who have worked for him. And m nearly all of the people that I've worked with who've worked for him are still working for him. Um, they, they have an enormous sense of loyalty to him. Um, and a, in uh, uh, my experience is that when someone works for you for a long time, it's generally because you're fair uh, and treat people well. So I'm not sure about the settlements that you were talking about, um, about the situations that you were particularly talking about. Again, um, I, I'm really not. Um, uh, but my experience is, and what I've seen, uh, is that he's a tremendous um, boss, uh, and he's someone who inspires people who work for him rather than the opposite. Great. Thank you for that question. Yeah, let's go to you in the orange. Hi. Um, earlier you mentioned that you were surprised that the media had an interest in you as Trump's lawyer, and I was just wondering why you were surprised, and do you think that there's a line that should be drawn um, by like how far the media goes in their interest in you and people like you that work for Trump? Okay. <laughs> um, two questions. Why, why I was surprised, and then do I think that there should be a line? Um, I think I was surprised because of, I, I, I don't think that I was, look, I've been around for a while, um, and I wasn't surprised that there was media interest. Dealt with the media a lot, um, it, you know, almost the course of my whole career. Um, but I was surprised at the intensity of the interest. I think that's the point. Um, so that there's so many things that are going on in the world right now, uh, that I was surprised that as a lawyer for the president or as a lawyer for someone in the news, that the lawyer would receive so much attention um, 
himself or herself. So I think that was, it was a matter of degree uh, in that situation. Uh, now, uh, the second part of the question, do I think that the media ought not to, um, you know, ought not to look there? Uh, we have this, you know, it's this funny, uh, this funny system here uh, in the United States of, um, you know, constitutional protections for free speech. The media can look at whatever it'd like to look at and ought to be free to look at whatever it would like to look at. Um, uh, so I don't, you know, I, I certainly don't think there ought to be any rules uh, for, uh, you know, uh, what it looks at and how it looks at. I, I do think that the media, like the rest of us, uh, should be guided by uh, principles of truth, accuracy, and uh, fairness. Um, and, and I'm not sure that they always are. Great. I think we have time for one more question. So, uh, yeah, let's go to you. First of all, thank you again. I'd like to echo um, all of the, the gratitude for coming and speaking to us. Um, in 2016, Oxford Dictionaries declared post-truth the word of the year, um, sort of signifying this new era really where um, subjective feelings have become more influential in swaying popular opinion than objective facts. What advice do you have for students considering a career in law in this sort of post-truth world. You're gonna have to explain this post-truth world to me a little bit better. Um, the, the word post-truth describing atmosphere where, um, where uh, people make decisions based on personal opinions and emotions rather than off of objective facts. I don't know how well I'm gonna do in that world. Um, uh, I, 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 you know, I, I kind of grew up with the idea that uh, try to deal with the reality. I mean, the whole thing my dad was about was dealing with the reality of things, dealing with facts. Doesn't mean that feelings aren't important, they're critically important, um, but I think we all need kind of a common ground, a common understanding of what reality is, and then we can kind of build from there. I don't know if it answers your question, but kind of the best that an old dinosaur can do. Thank you. Great, that is all we have time for. So please do join me in thanking Mark Kasovitz.